Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be with you once again. It is February. We have books to talk about. We have authors to talk to. I am I'm just happy to be here and I'm happy that you're with me. I hope you had a good weekend and that your week is off to a great start our weekend. Why, when I get to this point on Tuesday, can I not remember what I've done over the weekend? I don't know. Um, Not a lot, but it was a good weekend, so that's good. It it continues to be lovely here. We're supposed to get rain, I think, Thursday and Friday this week, which we desperately need, so I am not begrudging the rain, but today was another absolutely gorgeous day, and I took the dogs for a walk on my lunch break, and we took pictures, okay, I took pictures of flowers, they sniffed flowers, the girl dog sniffed flowers, the girl dog loves to sniff, she will sniff anything, the boy dog just likes to pee on everything, (laughs) that's what he does on walks, so um, I took pictures of flowers, Uh, Tallulah, the girl dog, sniffed the flowers, and I tried not to let Chalupa, the boy dog, pee on too many flowers. That was way probably more information than you needed, but that is okay. So, I, like I said, hope you had a good weekend and that your week is off to a great start. Today, I am talking to co-authors. Um, so far, I've talked to twin sisters, as you know, and I've talked to brothers who are co-authors. And this is my first father-daughter co-author team. So that's kind of fun. Um, I am speaking today with Marty Oliout. Nope, see, I did it. Marty Olhout. I t- told myself, I, you know how to pronounce it. You've listened to him pronounce it. Do not pronounce it like you're trying to learn Portuguese. Marty Olhout and his daughter, Grace Lai. Let me explain the Portuguese comment. The LH sound in Portuguese is a lia sound, and that's not correct. My my Portuguese accent is terrible, but it's kind of a lia sound. Um, so every time I see the LH in there, in Marty's last name, I think Olhout, because my brain is trying to learn Portuguese. It's Olhout. <laughs> so... Uh, today I'm speaking with father and daughter Marty Olhout and his daughter Grace Lai. They have written a memoir together. It is called Tent for Seven. And let me make sure I get the subtitle correct. I, I do this during the interview too. I just want to make sure that I am telling you the correct subtitle. So the whole name of the book is Tent for Seven, A Camping Adventure Gone South Out West. Love the play on words, uh, but I always have to look at it to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Uh, Marty Olhout loved the great outdoors, and he loved his family. But this time, the combination proved disastrous. Cooped up inside due to long work hours, Marty was excited about taking off with his wife and five children for the beautiful Canadian Rockies. Aware that this could be their last camping trip together, he wanted to make it extra memorable. Little did he know how memorable it would be. From a massive heat wave and tainted water to encounters with aggressive red ants and formidable bears, they experienced one problem after another. Then tragedy struck, forcing Marty to face the terrifying possibility of losing a loved one. With the help of mysterious strangers in one of the world's most awe-inspiring locations, he fought to keep his family alive and his sanity intact. Now, three dec- decades later, he joins forces with his gr- with his daughter, Grace Lai, to recount the gripping tale of ill-fated, that ill-fated vacation. Written with candor and wit reminiscent of Bill Bryson, Tent for Seven vividly captures both the grandeur and the dangers of the wilderness as Marty learns just how much his wife and children mean to him and how fragile life can be. 
That is the description, again, of Tent for Seven. It is a memoir. It is a a story about this incredibly eventful camping trip that Marty and his family went on. And it's you, you heard the description. So first of all, I read that description. I knew what the book was about. Um, longtime readers know that my interviews tend to be scheduled way in advance. So even though I'd read the description when I got the information from the publicist and set up this this interview, I knew it was a memoir and I knew that it was about a very eventful trip and things kind of went wrong, but I hadn't fully remembered the, those details about, you know, the possibility of losing a loved one and, and all of that stuff. I just knew that there was going to be, um, misadventures, let's say. And then we're going to talk about this more in the book. I got to the page where the, wow. <laughs> I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to tell you everything that happens because, whew, but despite these many misadventures, despite the fact that tragedy was a very real possibility, this, this is going to sound strange, but this story is a lot of fun. It is told with so much heart and so much warmth, and you really experience the events as the family was experiencing them, specifically as Marty was experiencing them, because it is told from Marty's perspective. Um, we hear from Grace about some of her perspectives on that trip as a, as a teenager at the time of the trip. Um, there are humorous stories. We also get flashbacks to a trip that Marty took in his younger days with several of his college friends, and they get into some crazy adventures. So there's a lot of humor. There is a lot of lightheartedness to the story, but there are definitely these darker, more serious undertones. But we we definitely get a sense of how this family operates, how they support one another and love one another and face difficult situations together. Um, So yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed the book and I really enjoyed speaking with Marty and Grace. So I'm going to let you listen to that conversation and I'm going to stop telling you about the book so they can. Again, the book is called Tent for Seven, A Camping Adventure Gone South Out West. Let's have that interview with Marty and Grace. Hi, Marty and Grace. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having us. Hey, Sarah, thanks. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here to talk about your book, Tent for Seven. Before we do that, um, well, first I will say that I've had um, I've had brothers, co-author brothers, and I just recently interviewed co-author yeah. twin sisters, but you are my first father-daughter combination. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Great. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind starting by just sharing a little bit about yourselves so my listeners can get to know you, that would be great. Okay, I'll let Grace go first. All right. Well, yeah, I'll start. Um, so I grew up in North Carolina. And after college, I went to NC State and my goal, I really wanted to see the world. And so I joined the American Red Cross uh, services to the armed forces. So I was stationed on military bases. And that is what allowed me to really travel the world for a couple of years. I was stationed in South Korea and I got to travel all over Asia. I was in Iraq for a few months and then Germany for a year and a half. So I got to see a lot, um, did a lot of traveling in those years. And When that was done, I decided I wanted to move back to the States. I didn't want to come back home yet. I wasn't ready to go back to North Carolina. So I had a sister living in D.C. So I moved to D.C. I moved in with her. Um, I worked at the White House. And then after that, I worked on another military base in D.C. And then I ended up uh, working undercover for the CIA. And I realized that that was not really the best fit for me. So I made a huge transition from undercover. And I moved to the Office of Public Affairs at the CIA. And that is actually where I started to do um, the bulk of my writing. I was a feature story writer and um, my, my stories went up on CIA.gov, which was the public website. Um, and so it was really there that I got a lot of confidence in my writing because we got a lot of feedback and the stories were really well received. And I think that really helped motivate me to um, finish the book that I had been working on with the realization that people do enjoy my writing. Um, I lived in DC for eight years and then I'm, I'm really not a city person. I like to be out in the country with the animals. So at that point, um, my husband and I moved back to Charlotte, North Carolina, and, um, 
I was able to fulfill my lifelong dream of owning a horse. And so uh, at this point in my life, I work on my writing. I have a five-year-old son and I, of course, spend a lot of time out at the barn with my horse. And Marty, um, let me just interrupt real quick before you introduce yourself. Grace, just reading your biography or your 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 quick bio, I wanted to ask you 800 million questions, (laughs) which I will not because that's not what we're here for. But wow. (laughs) Yeah. And actually, Marty, yours is almost as interesting. So go ahead. That's a tough act to follow. Yeah, yeah, I should have let you go first. (laughs) I'm going to have to make some stuff up, Sarah, okay? (laughs) Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll follow Grace's format. I, I, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, the flatlands of uh, the Midwest. Um, m- I worked for IBM, started with IBM there, moved to Texas for a couple of years. Unfortunately, in the flat part of Texas also, we were in Dallas. Uh, they moved to Charlotte and have been here for the last 40 years. Um, married Jolene about 47 years ago. Jolene sort of is the heroine of the story, actually. Um, and we'll be 48 if she'll stick with me for a couple more weeks here. Um, uh, I retired after 32 years from IBM and taught classes for mainly large consulting firms. And that, it was a great experience because uh, they sent me all over the world or for the next 12 years and got to visit a lot of countries, a lot of states. Um, and it was humbling to, to realize how little I really knew about the world and countries and people and cultures. Uh, so I learned a ton over those 12 years. Uh, and it was great because I, I love traveling. Um, I love being outdoors, and, and that's kind of what got us into this trip we took out to British Columbia that we talk about in the book. And um, I wish I'd I wish I'd have been undercover with the CIA, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could have done it. <laughs> well, it, I'm glad you didn't make up that because it would have been a little suspicious had you both been undercover with the CIA. I, I might have then looked at both of you with a side eye, but um, you mentioned moving to Texas. I had the opposite experience. I grew up in Montana and then moved to Texas to the Dallas area after college. And it was so flat that I was constantly lost because I grew up navigating by knowing what mountain I was heading towards. Yeah. And so, it was hot down there too. <laughs> it was, it was warm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so the book is a memoir. I love the title. The full title is Tent for Seven, A Camping Adventure Gone South Out West. Uh, can you give an overview of the story? Yes. <laughs> uh, a, a quick overview. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, uh, I love traveling. Jolene likes to travel and we had taken the kids on several camping trips, um, starting when Angela, before Angela was even born, our youngest, and then uh, we took a couple of trips locally here in North Carolina, and then we graduated to taking longer trips out west. We'd gone to Colorado and been to the West Coast, and we decided we'd have a big trip, maybe our last one because the girls were getting a little bit older and getting kind of tired of it. So we went to British Columbia for two weeks, and we had um, not had any significant mishaps that, that you could even write a short story about prior to that. But what we didn't know was that they were all being stored up for this uh, big trip to British Columbia. So we had um, starting, even before, the, even before the trip started, little things started going wrong, or actually some bigger things started going wrong. And once we got up there, they just started mounting up one after the other. Uh, so pretty much everything that had not gone wrong for 10 years started coming into those two weeks. But at the same time that we were having all these mishaps, and some of them were pretty severe, uh, out of nowhere, folks were showing up to help us. And not just... Uh, arbitrarily, but we had some very specific needs on some occasions. And we had experts in those fields come out of nowhere to help us and frequently disappear as quickly as they had appeared. So it was was just a series of incredible events and incredible help to the point where we're kind of wondering is what's going on. This is like uh, we have somebody guiding us into all these problems and then guiding us out again. So uh, it was just that whole sequence of events um, th- that were so unusual. We thought we just really needed to write this down. And uh, it's written in a very humorous, we tend to make a very humorous book. So it's, it's not a serious uh, book in general, but there's a couple of serious things that happens throughout the trip. And that maybe not a very quick overview, but that's kind of <laughs> a run. No, that, 
That was great. And, you know, the, with the title, you know that things are going to go wrong when you start reading. But I'm I'm reading along and, it, you know, you're having a mishap here, a mishap there. And then about page 80, 85, somewhere in there, I was like, holy buckets. Yeah, this just went incredibly wrong. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't want to give a lot away because people want to read it. But, yeah, <laughs> um, it definitely took a turn. Yeah. Grace, somewhere I read that you you read your dad's notes for the story, right? Is that am I remembering that correctly? And kind of decided maybe it should be a memoir. Yes, um, it was kind of funny because right after the trip, my dad wrote down everything that happened for his therapeutic purposes, and I don't think I even knew he was doing it. Um, and it wasn't until like 15 years later where I found this, you know, all of his notes about that camping trip. And, you know, along with those notes, he had written down a lot of um, stories from his trip that he had taken with five friends when he was 20. Right after college, he and some guys uh, did a road trip out west for 10 weeks. And so a lot of those stories were written down as well. And I remember thinking, you know, if I rework this a bit, this could be a really entertaining book. And so, you know, it's funny because it wasn't so much that I felt, okay, this specific story needs to be told. It was more that I had all this material to work with and I'd always wanted to write a book. And I thought, well, here's the perfect opportunity to use this material and turn it into an entertaining book. Absolutely. It is time for our first break of this episode. I will say this is one of the more unique ways a book was um, brought to fruition uh, that I have, at least that of the authors that I have spoken with. So that is fun. Keep this conversation in mind because we're going to come back to it when we return from the the break. In the meantime, stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Marty Olhout and Grace Lai about their memoir, Tent for Seven. Remember before the break, Grace was saying that she found her father's accounting of their trip to the Canadian Rockies and um, Glacier National Park, among other places, and decided that it would make a great book. So we are picking up that conversation um, with my next comment. And um, Marty, what did you think when she first brought this this thought to you, this idea to you? I don't think he really knew. <laughs> yeah, to really, <laughs> I think I might have heard something about it. And I, yeah, you know, when I had really written your, what we call sometimes the original manuscript, it really was a, a PTSD exercise just to get it out of off my mind so I could sleep at night. And I felt so bad for what I had done to everybody. Uh, and uh, I put it on a shelf and it was it was there maybe for the grandkids to read, you know, 30 or 40 years later. And so when I heard that she was working on it, it I embarrassed to kind of say it didn't make much impact. I thought, <laughs> what's she going to do with it? And <laughs> yeah. that was kind of it. And, <laughs> and then I and then I came to him one day and I said, we have a publishing contract for your book. <laughs> uh, and then and then he got back on board with it pretty quickly. <laughs> so. Marty, you wrote down the the therapeutic version of events, just kind of what I would call the writing equivalent of a verbal vomit um, to when you got home, right? And then Grace, you took it and and created it from there, mixing in the old stories. How did it then work? Did you did you work on it together at some point, or talk about what maybe needed to be edited? Yeah, it was kind of interesting because it really went from zero collaboration to full collaboration. Um, I mean, he 
you know, he wrote everything down. I had nothing to do with it. When I went to rewrite it, like he said, he didn't even know I was doing it. So it was, we were so isolated in the original workings of the book. Um, and then it was funny because as soon as we had a publishing contract, we were like a hundred percent collaborating on the book. I mean, down to practically every word that is in the book. Um, and, and along with our publisher, of course, she provided a lot of feedback on things that we needed to work on or rewrite. And so it kind of just, we went back and forth with it a lot. I would work on a section, send it to him. He would work on it, um, make some suggestions that I would go back and work on it again. And it really was the two of us in close collaboration, um, really just working on the book together, figuring out, uh, you know, what we should include, what we needed to work on and edit. Um, and along with Sandra, our, so we published with Sandra Jonas Publishing House. And so we worked very closely with Sandra too. Um, she was really instrumental in kind of guiding us in the theory of storytelling and making sure that we were showing, not telling. Um, but yes, we were, at, you know, for the last two years, before the book came out, we were working very, very closely. It was it was pretty funny when I first looked at what Grace had done. When you know she finally came and said, "Hey, I, I've rewritten your book," <laughs> and I looked through it, I said, "Grace, you've ruined my manuscript." <laughs> and she said, "Well, the publisher likes it." I said, "Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> no." It was, well, I think part of it was the way it was originally written. I thought, you know, I found it really interesting. And after I reread it and I thought, you know, part of why I found it so interesting was because it was about me and my family. And I think our family and friends would have enjoyed it the way it was. But the public at large, <laughs> you know, it needed to be reworked for the general public and not just people that knew us. <laughs> Right. Was, you you translated it into modern English is kind of what you did. <laughs> um, were there, because you do have flashbacks mainly to your, your trip, your post high school trip, was it high college trip, post college trip, Marty, uh, with your, uh, free, with your friends. Um, we all from the University of Cincinnati. And- yes. Um, so were there other stories that, with that, or did you kind of go through that, those experiences and, and choose the ones that fit with the, the narrative of the story you were telling about your family vacation? How did that work in the process? Yeah, that was really hard because there were so many good, <laughs> there were so many to choose from and we wanted to stick them all in. But if you start sticking things in where they don't fit, you lose the readers. So we had to be very, you know, we, we had to leave out a lot of stories that we would have liked to have included, but I think our main criteria for the flashbacks were, can you transition in and out of it smoothly? And does it make sense to include it in the larger story, you know, particularly the chapter that we stuck them in. So um, I, it's funny because I personally am not a fan of flashbacks. Like I don't like to read books that have flashbacks in them. So I think I was very cognizant of that and very deliberate in which ones we chose and how we got into and out of them. It's interesting because we did end up moving some of them around. Yes. So I had, where I had positioned them, like oh, yeah. even, even the first one, it's book kind of starts off on a flashback that was originally like chapter, chapter three or yeah, so. Yeah. So they got much better positioned in the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, Marty, I say this with all the love in my heart. You're a little bit crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I've never heard that before. (laughs) I can't imagine no one's ever said that to you, but it makes me, you mentioned that Jolene is the heroine of this book and she is in a lot of ways, but mainly because she's never just smothered you with a pillow. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Well, well, actually we took that, we took that part (laughs) off. Oh my gosh, my I I I my hair got more gray just reading this book. Um, do you want to? Would, uh, would would you mind choosing just one story to share with listeners? Obviously, we want to, them to read the book themselves, but is there one story that you can share just to pique their interest a little bit more? <laughs> well, do you have one, Sarah, that struck you? <laughs> uh, okay, well, I will say this: I grew up in Montana. Like I said before, I grew up two hours from Glacier National Park where you spend a bit of the book. The number of bear encounters you've had in your life, I have not had in my, my entire time in Montana. My, what, 
talk about what pheromones you put off that you attract bears. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting. Um, I guess I can somehow to say this one, one of our, uh, less favorable reviews that we received was from a reader who said, I read about the first third of this book and I, this is just too wild. It's clearly exaggerated. Uh, I don't believe it. I'm going to quit reading it. And there's clearly the guy that's had this many bear encounters has got to be making this up. And I thought, man, if the guy would have read the rest of the book, if he thought, if he thought the first part was unbelievable, <laughs> he didn't even get the real stuff. Um, and the fact of the matter, all the bear encounters that are in that book, there, there's actually a few more that didn't make it in. So you, that's a good question. I must have something <laughs> going yeah. on that attracts bears. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. Um, I guess just the, uh, well, the honey bears, we call it the honey bear story. The, the first one uh, is that's kind of a, that was the, maybe the most, um, what's the word dramatic of all my bear encounters. You know, I was out in the middle of the, we were camping out. I'd wanted to get away from the guys. This is on the wild west trip because we'd been together for six weeks and it was like, I needed to get away. And we were already up in the high country in Yosemite. So I just, I walked out in the woods about 25 yards away from the guys and plopped down on the leaves in my sleeping bag. And I uh, was drifted off to sleep looking at the moon, the full moon coming over the horizon. And I, mu- I must have gone right to sleep. And I woke up what seemed like a minute later and I looked up and the moon was no longer over the horizon. It was like way up in the sky. And I thought, wow, I've been, I've been asleep. I wonder what woke me up. And about the time I said that, this, this looked like an elephant came walking by me <laughs> laying on the ground. And I looked up at, and I could smell this thing as much as I could see it. It was a monster. I mean, I looked like an elephant walking by and he was crunching right past me. Uh, and I went to say something like an idiot. I'm not sure what I was thinking. I thought I got to warn these guys and I couldn't breathe. I was totally frozen. Uh, <laughs> an experience I'd never had before. <laughs> totally speechless. And I guess it was self-protection because the bear then sauntered on past, headed over for the campsite and, you know, but went on to wreak havoc in the campsite as we mentioned in the book, but nobody got hurt. He was after food and he got his food and <laughs> we, uh, we all survived. And I'm not sure we got any smarter for that because that, we were too young to get. <laughs> because the next day you <laughs> found out that, you know, why was this bear in our campsite in the first place? And right. then one of the guys was like, Oh, I, I might have poured honey all over the ground and the picnic table in the campsite. Cause I wanted to see oh. a bear. What yeah. Is- yeah. He's the one that should have the lifelong bear encounters because the word went out that, hey, follow this guy. He leaves honey. Exactly. Which is one of the, I'm Uh, like, I don't know how anybody, well, first of all, so yes, bears really do like honey. I mean, we've now that point has been proven, but I don't know why anybody would intentionally do that. But I guess 20 year old, a bunch of 20 year old guys is, you know, awful. (laughs) <laughs> you, and, you and Jolene have five kids four girls and one boy and I was very happy to find out that Max has made it to adulthood um, <laughs> yes. because he had quite some adventures on this 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 trip as well um, so I was happy to find that out uh, oh, I'd also like to know Grace because your dad wrote the initial manuscript, what was it like for you reading that and kind of reading about your your own parts? You know, you're, you're a teenager at this point. You're mostly interested in boys and horses. So what was it like to read about yourself, you know, many, several years later? It was it was really entertaining. And I think that's why the first time I read it, I thought this, you know, everybody's going to love it. This This should be a book. And then I really thought back and I was like, you know, I think it was so funny to me because it was all about me and my family. And I, you know, I didn't know what my dad was thinking during that trip, but I got to find out. And so I just, it was very interesting to me to read about an experience that I had had from a completely different point of view. Um, and I, I was very entertained also by the flashbacks. And I think, you know, so I have always been, like, I love to travel and I, I mean, I like, I love to travel more than I would say just your average person. Like, I mean, I lived overseas and I went to all these countries that most, like I've been to North Korea and Mongolia and the Philippines, like most people 
those aren't their <laughs> top destinations. And so there was always a little piece of me that wondered, where does this come from? Because it just like, I, I don't know. I just feel like most people aren't as adventurous, you know, as adventurous. And I've always just kind of wondered where I got it from. And then really it was reading that manuscript and reading all of my dad's stories and his love of the outdoors and, you know, mountains and hiking that I finally understood, okay, I guess I get most of this from my dad. Well, I definitely don't get it from my mom because she is so cautious. Uh, not that she likes to travel too, but she's, she wouldn't go running with the bulls in Spain and a lot of the other stuff I've done, which I learned to do and then tell her afterwards. So she doesn't have to worry about like, I've survived. This is what I did. I survived. Um, when I went to North Korea, I know I've, I'm sidetracking, but when I went to North Korea, I told my dad where I was going and I said, but just, you know, I'll tell mom when I get back because otherwise she's going to spend two days in complete terror that something um, was going to happen to me. But I think reading the manuscript was very um, enlightening for me to realize where I got sort of my adventurous spirit. Uh, There were a few flashbacks that I would have preferred to have lived my life without ever knowing about, (laughs) specifically the nudist beach visit. Uh, nobody yes. wants to picture their dad on a nudist beach. I'm like, oh, I don't need to know about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot that that was in there. <laughs> I was like, okay, but um, it, but you know that that story had such an interesting ending with you know the two people you know having their marriage ceremony and running <laughs> off, and um, so even that story I thought was. Although not what I wanted to picture, I was like, this is actually a crazy story. There there were so many crazy stories and things he had done, and it was really fun to read about them. Yes, I can I can imagine. Um let's go ahead and take our second break of this episode. When we come back, we will find out from Marty if he was ever able to convince his family to go on any other vacation ever. (laughs) Obviously, you know the answer to that, at least for Grace, because she talked about traveling, right? But we'll find out about the family as a whole. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with Marty Olhout and Grace Lai. This was a very eventful trip, as we have mentioned multiple times. What was the process of um, convincing your family, Marty, that they should actually take another vacation? Oh, well, that's a, well. <laughs> you know, I don't, it was so long ago, I don't remember for sure, but I, but I should tell you, um, strangely enough, Two years later, uh, we decided to revisit the site. We decided, or you decided? (laughs) I don't think we had any choice. Well, you didn't, but I I really don't remember. I think Jolene and I was maybe it was a little bit of you know, like after you get the criminal going back and visiting the scene of the crime. uh, We actually flew back uh, to uh, we went into Seattle and we drove back to uh, the place where the not not the Emerald Lake the actual accident, but we went to the, the, to the first hospital that she had visited uh, in Golden. Uh, So we retraced some of the steps. We got to Golden uh, and we decided it was, 
kind of funny. We got there, we spent a little time there, and we decided that, okay, you know what, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough retracing. Let's head west and go to some places we haven't been. Um, so we did do that. Uh, and we went back a year later, or two years later to Colorado, but we actually, we stayed in a friend's condo based in Crested Butte and we were, we only camped for one or two days. And then that was kind of it. We did go to Alaska two it. years later. But so, Julie and I did not go to Alaska. Julie refused to go anywhere. The oldest, she refused to go anywhere. She was, she was traumatized the most out of the kids by that trip. So she was not going anywhere at that point. And I would have loved to have gone, but I was working on a dude ranch in Colorado that summer. That is why I didn't go. Not because I wouldn't have wanted to have gone. Right. We did RV camp, but we had we had yeah, big, yeah. we did have Big Blue with us. So some of us slept in the RV, and some of us did Big Blue, and then that was that was kind of it for extravaganzas. <laughs> we there, we did a few more weekend camping trips in North Carolina to Sliding Rock, so only like two hours away. But even those, Jolene, my mom's tolerance for those even <laughs> went down rapidly. Yeah, and yeah. then sure. that was kind of the end of it. Then. <laughs> Do you still have Big Blue, even just for nostalgia's sake? Um, you know, I didn't know this for sure. Max just told me this recently. Uh, he, he and his friends uh, at the end of college took Big Blue down to Myrtle Beach. It wasn't pretty sad. And Big Blue was falling apart. She, he had put in a lot of years. <laughs> and they took him to Myrtle Beach at a campsite, and they were out on the beach uh, doing whatever, you know, a bunch of guys do on the beach at night. And the wind picked up, and while they were sitting around with their feet in the surf, <laughs> a 40-mile-an-hour wind took Big Blue down the beach. <laughs> and you know, the seams were coming apart, and the, and <laughs> the poles were all bent. Uh, and unfortunately, they did not seek Big Blue out. They left her. I figured it was a yeah. fitting end. So I down the beach, and no one ever Big saw Blue them again. blew away. <laughs> I was the <laughs> end. I, I am now composing a children's book in my head about the adventures Big Blue is having. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I um, know. It's so bad. Uh, it was very sad, but she needed a more proper disposal. I know. <laughs> Besides um, a good chuckle here and there, what do you hope that readers will take away from reading the book? Um, well, for me, I think my main purpose sort of for putting it together as a book was really purely entertainment purposes. I really did just want to give people a break from life and thinking about their problems and pressure and stress and, Hey, just pick up this book, forget about life, have a laugh and just sort of live vicariously through this funny story. Um, that was definitely the main goal. I will say a side goal was to um, educate just a little bit and so I would say I am I am mostly responsible for putting in the little tidbits of information, uh, like the names of the mountains or the competition between Mount Massive and um, Mount um, Albert. Yes. So so I did want to put those sort of little very interesting little facts and tidbits. I like to sprinkle those throughout the book so people learn a little bit um, throughout. And then I would also say sort of maybe as a as a takeaway message, um, you know, we had so many people help us throughout the book. And so I hope that it inspires people to offer help when they see, you know, people that need help, even if it's just something little. Um, and then really on the other hand too, to accept that help. My dad was very reluctant to accept the offer from the Walshes when they invited us into their home. And she said to him, you know, if we were in this situation, wouldn't you do the same thing for us? And I love that part of the book because I think it really makes you think about generosity and helping other people and how far would you go to help strangers? I mean, they did not know us. We were complete strangers and they were inviting, you know, a family of seven into their home. That is such a huge act of kindness and generosity. And I think that I, I hope that people are inspired to, you know, just to perform even just little acts of kindness um, after reading our book and realizing what a difference and an impact it can make on somebody's life. And I should add just, for, you know, Sandra, Sandra Jonas was very helpful after reading the original manuscript and, and well, and, and what Grace had done, she goes, you know, you got some neat themes in here yeah. that are really uh, poignant, but you probably need to bring them out a little more. And, 
And so we did, she really helped us to do that. And a little bit of what Grace was saying, part of it was about the, you know, the kindness of friends and uh, be aware of what you can do yourself. Uh, the strength that we took from the family through, through all of this. Um, and also even the, the little bit of the divine intervention. Uh, a lot of people have commented when they read the book that they've had similar experiences. Oh, yeah. Uh, almost to the point where it's kind of spooky. And, you know, and how the, the priest's words that day really, uh, you know, be ready for this kind of stuff and be prepared and just deal with it. Um, but <laughs> also got a lot of comments, people saying, you know, I never wanted to go camping. And now I really don't want to go camping. <laughs> so, uh, Although we have also had people, it is kind of interesting because. I don't think it turns people on or off. I think it just strengthens their conviction, whichever way they were already <laughs> leaning there. You know, they love camping. They read it and they think it's funny. And they're like, I can't wait to go on my next camping trip. And people who don't camp read it and say, say this is why I don't camp. So <laughs> it is kind of interesting. We don't sway at people like one way yeah. or the other. We just we kind just of strengthen their further. thoughts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I grew up camping and, um, that we thankfully never had this level of experiences. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> yeah. um, how about the two of you? Did you take away anything specific from, from the writing and, and especially, you know, working on it together? Yes. I think, um, I think that both of us are good writers, but there is more to it than that. And I didn't know that <laughs> before <laughs> right. we published the book. I mean, really specifically before we started working with Sandra, um, she really is good. She knows the theory and the art of storytelling. She's a master at that. And she really provided us the guidance that we needed to revise the book, to incorporate all of those aspects of storytelling and to make it what it is today. Um, she's also incredibly good at grammar. She knows <laughs> where every period, semicolon, comma, and she knows why they go there. And she, you know, she can explain it. Um, so it was, she was really instrumental in putting the book together. But um, yeah, that was, it, it was almost just like the last two years with her, I feel like was almost like a getting my master's degree in <laughs> writing yeah. because there was so there's just so much theory that I did not realize that, you know, behind the art of storytelling. So I, I've learned so much from her. I mean, that was pretty, I mean, right. Uh, well, no, that's what I kind of told you to say. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, I will say that semicolons are tricky. So having someone who completely understands them is very, very valuable. It was uh, like, I mean, truly, thankfully for her, because I am terrible at grammar and I don't know what we would have done without yeah, her. She doesn't like commas. What are those little dash things? Oh, she would get very upset with the, yeah. the M dashes, right? M -dashes. She, was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she was probably so frustrated with us because grammar was neither one of our strong points. So. Well, she would, she Let's really did M dash though. <laughs> She very specifically helped us with character development, yeah. uh, with bro drawing the themes out, mm -hmm. uh, showing what's going on in yeah. the situation rather than telling it, um, and, and uh, huge help, yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Do you think you would, I mean, this is a pretty specific set of events that you wrote about, but do you think you would write another memoir in the future? Either yeah. or both of you? Um, yes. Well, you can, there, there is... Um, so we've, we've gotten a lot of reviews on the book and people are loving it, which makes us both very happy. There's nothing that I like more than to read a yeah, review. Or there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then be telling how wonderful the book is. But, it, but it's, I mean, it really is nice because it's, it makes me feel like I have fulfilled my goal of entertaining people and making people laugh. And that's what we wanted to do. Um, and so several people have, you know, made comments like, when are they going to write another book? I hope they write more. I think this is their only one. So it's kind of been a motivating force. Um, so we've been discussing the possibility of writing just a book about the Wild West trip, which is the trip that uh, my dad went on with his friends, the 10-week camping trip out west. Um, so we're going to see if we can. He, does, he has a journal from that, and some of his friends that went on the trip kept journals. So we do have some material to work with um, to turn that into a book. And then I also 
Luckily, because I have a terrible memory, but I have also kept detailed notes of all of my travels and the trips I took. So I have um, a decent amount of material to work with from my time at the Red Cross and living overseas and at the White House and the CIA. So I would also like to write the, the story of my adventures as well. The Grace's notes. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. From your experience then, because you came, you came into writing in a slightly different path than maybe some authors take. What advice would you, would you give to someone who maybe has something they think would be a good memoir? My advice really from my experience would be to have a small team around you that can sort of fill in the holes. And, and that just kind of goes back to really what Sandra helped us with. Um, you know, kind of know what you're good at and know where you need some help and find somebody that can help you with like with the grammar, uh, with the storytelling, I think, or even just with this whole the whole publishing process. I mean, we had a good book, but if we didn't have somebody who knew the publishing industry, you know, it probably wouldn't have gone anywhere. So I think, you know, recognizing what you're good at and then having people around you who are good at the things that you're not so good at. I think is really instrumental and is key. Yeah, I would agree with that. (laughs) At one point, maybe halfway through our editing process with uh, Sandra, we got done one afternoon around seven o'clock and a a two hour session. I said, Sandra, do you spend this much time with all your authors? She goes, I've never spent anywhere near this time with any of my authors. (laughs) And I said, "Uh Oh, (laughs) <laughs> she goes, you know, usually the manuscripts are a little further along. She goes, but the story is so good that I feel like it's worth putting the time into it. And that kind of goes with what Grace is saying. And I, if I thought I could have saved everybody a whole lot more time if I'd had any idea what I was doing you know, about character development, about showing versus telling and uh, clarifying things, uh, I could have... <laughs> um, it would have been very helpful to have a little more uh, knowledge about the basics of authorship. Yeah, sure. But, you know, the, it was a very specific process, so not probably something you were thinking about necessarily. Right. Yeah, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. Right. The answer came along and I was like, wow, there's a lot that I didn't know. <laughs> well, you know, as a little aside, maybe it might be of interest. You know, we talked about the PTSD when we got back from the trip. It, means it sort of really was that. I, I couldn't sleep at night. And after about a month, of not sleeping at night, <laughs> a number of friends had said when they heard the story, like, oh my God, you should write a book. You should you know, write a book. Uh, I, you know, I never paid much attention to that until one night I'm going, you know, maybe that's what it's going to take to get over this. Maybe I just start writing this down instead of laying her awake at night. And, and that's really how it got started. I would, if I couldn't sleep, which happened most nights, I'd whip out my laptop, which, which about the size of a suitcase then in <laughs> 1995, <laughs> And I just start typing away until I fell asleep. And I did that for a couple of months. And by that time I'd had five or six or eight chapters and then I just kept working on it. But it really was just a stream of consciousness, as you said earlier, um, was, was not meant for production. Sure. It's time for our final break of this episode, but I will say for something that was not meant for production, I know there was a lot of work that went into it to get it ready to, um, for, for us, the, the general public to read, but it, it really turned out well. Um, so good job, Marty, on writing all those, all those thoughts down as soon as you got home and, and for the catharsis as well. It's a, it's a very good plan. Let's go ahead and take that last break. When we come back, Marty and Grace will share some of the books that they enjoy reading. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Marty Olhout and Grace Lai. How about um, the, the other side of the coin? Instead of writing, reading, um, Grace, what are some of your favorite authors and genre, genres? Oh, my favorite author is Bill Bryson. Um, I love him. I think he is hysterical. I think he's brilliant. I think the way he manages to educate through entertainment is um, it's really impressive and it's very difficult. And I will say I've reread. I mean, I, there's a couple of his books that I reread really constantly because there's they're so full of interesting facts. And every time I listen to it or read it, I learn something new. And so I think that is a real talent and a skill. So he's my favorite. Um, really, any book that captures my attention and that I can't put down, I like. But I will say that's pretty much nonfiction. I really don't read fiction at all. It's, uh, the, I will only dip into maybe historical fiction. But that's as far as I go into fiction. I'm pretty much only nonfiction. I love true stories. I love memoirs. I love reading about people's lives. Um, and I just, you know, for me, I just feel like there are so many incredible things that have happened that have actually happened. I'd rather read about those than stuff that's made up. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, for me too, it is educational um, learning about other people's lives or World War II. Just there's just so much. I think there's just so many incredible true stories that are out there. So that's pretty much what I stick with. Sure. Yeah. I like Bill Bryson as well. Um, Marty, same question for you. Well, once again, <laughs> Grace has copied I my saw- answers off my. <laughs> probably you can the- say Bill Bryson, too. Yeah, you're going to go first. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, I really have read several of his books. Um, I started out with the short history, short of, nearly history of nearly everything, everything. and I couldn't believe yeah. it's just a fantastic book. And yeah. then I've read several other ones of his. Somebody once said, "Hey, you know, your your book reads a lot like a walk in the woods." And I said, "Well, I, I want you to know that he actually wrote that book after I wrote this original manuscript. So I, I'm not sure who copied who here on that book. It, just took, it took us like 20 years to get our to get ours published, though. Print, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a camera in your house or something, maybe? Well, I, you know, we, we've, we're we're trying to make contact, but <laughs> um, but same as Grace, I'm in, I'm much more into historical novels, tr- uh, true travel adventures, yeah. uh, exploring kind of books, and. Uh, you know, guys like Irving Stone and Stephen Ambrose have written great books. Uh, you know, uh, Lewis and Clark and The Settling of the West. But that's that's pretty much what Mary I, Roach. I like her book. Uh, All right, wonderful. Um, if people are interested in learning more about the book and maybe um, about you as well, can talk about internet presence. So, website if you have one, social media that either of you are active on. Yes, we both have websites. Uh, mine is gracelieauthor.com and Marty's is just martyolhout.com. Uh, we are both on Facebook, although one of us is more active than the other. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably guess who that is. Um, but I am Grace Lie on Facebook and Marty is Marty Olhout on Facebook. I am also on Instagram, grace.lie underscore author. I think Marty is too, but he hasn't logged in in like three years, so I wouldn't bother going there. <laughs> well, and you know, it's not like you have pictures or vid- really any much, much evidence from this book. I was I was disappointed there weren't pictures with the book, but then, you know, you keep reading about everything that happened in terms of taking pictures or video. So, Well, that's, uh, a, that's an interesting <laughs> question in the, in the book. We, we went back and forth about putting pictures in the book itself um, and uh, Sandra convinced us that the best thing to do was just to put the, the pictures at the beginning of each chapter. Uh, and then we had a sort, you know, we had a whole bunch of pictures that we could use. Unfortunately, we'd have five pictures for oh. chapter five and no p- pictures for chapter six. So we did wrestle quite a bit with um, uh, determining which pictures to use. We, we thought about putting pictures in the middle of chapters that fit things in the middle of the chapter, but uh, it's just a, we decided it's just a little too distracting, distracting yeah. Yeah, in the book. Sure, makes sense. Um, one one final question is, is that what does Jolene think of the book? Is does she enjoy it or does it just bring up too many bad memories? She um That's a I'll, good question. Well, yeah, she's uh she's very supportive of the book. She's 
been, she been amazingly helpful. She's probably our biggest publicist. Uh, but she is not. Uh, Has she read it? She, no. <laughs> I was say, I, okay. <laughs> I, I thought she'd made it to like chapter. Well, right to where whatever you said, uh, Sarah, page 83. Yeah. And then she had. Um, and then she attempted to skip forward a couple chapters. <laughs> she, um, and, no, I understand. <laughs> she hasn't. She told me one time when I was working on it, she's like, I I think this is this is before you maybe were involved, but she started reading it. She's like, I don't know what chapter she made it to like chapter four. So she's like, I just started getting so mad at your dad again that I had to stop reading it. <laughs> I was like, okay, well. <laughs> yeah. Julie, Julie hasn't uh, read it. I don't yeah. think Angela has read it, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Read it. Molly but, loves it. Molly read it and she was one of our early readers and gave us feedback. So, so was, did Max, I think Max read it maybe an earlier draft, but Julie yeah. and my mom have absolutely not read it for sure. Amazingly. <laughs> Jolene has been our biggest supporter. She is, she carries the bookmarks around. She's, um, uh, she tells, she tells people about the book. I mean, she's very, she's been very supportive in like the marketing of the book. She's got some, uh, some of the book club really website it. and she helps promote it with book clubs, yeah. which, which oh, by the way. Yeah, no, I, we, we did a book club, um, which we love doing. If people want to have us at their book club, that was so much fun. Um, and Jolene was invited to it. And so we thought she was, you know, she, she, she could come and just kind of watch, but the women in this book club loved meeting her and loved talking to her. So she she was a huge hit at the book club too. Yeah, so. yeah we were kind of jealous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, she would have a different perspective. So um, I was just curious. It just occurred to me, Angela's only six during this story. Does she have a completely different memory of this trip than than everyone else? You know, from what I know. And maybe, I don't know if you can correct me, she, I don't think she remembers much of it. Um, I think she's seen, she was kind of oblivious. Now, I will say this, we were all kind of oblivious, believe it or not, to the severity of uh, what was going on with my mom. I mean, we obviously knew something terrible had happened, but I don't think we realized how serious it was. And it actually... I, I remember specifically after the trip, we were home back in Charlotte, and I don't know if it might have actually even been a few years later where my mom told me that um, she, if the injuries had gone a little bit further, she would have lost um, the use of her arm and the one in her leg, if it had just been like a millimeter to one side or the other, she would have bled to death. I mean, it was, I, you know, my dad and my mom were very good at sheltering us from how bad things had really gotten. Well, interesting little side note. I didn't know this either until just a few weeks ago or months ago. Um, I, I was for I for, felt it was my responsibility to keep things under control. So we tried to make sure that, you know, we weren't, that the kids were kind of protected from the anxiety of everything that was happening. Uh, and I sort of did the same thing with Jolene, but she's a nurse. So I, there's, you know, you can only hide so much, but I didn't realize this until recently. She said that she did not realize uh, at the time this happened, how severe things were. Uh, she's, you know, she was like, you, you started mentioning in, in the book, you know, about these wounds being, you know, you know, potentially fatal. And she said, I had no concept uh, that I was hurt that bad. Even up until she read the book. Oh, well. At one point in the book, the doctor, I think when she realized it was the doctor said, you're not going to die or something about you're not going to die. And at that, and, and she didn't even realize that she had how close to death she actually had come. Yeah, I don't think even then she said she didn't even pay much attention to that statement. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Wow. Well. Marty and Grace, we've talked about a lot, um, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to make sure you highlighted? Um, well, just, just what I'll, I'll just underline what Grace said earlier. We've uh, we've done a couple of book clubs, and we've got a couple more lined up, and we we found those were those were so um, what's the word fun fun <laughs> we, rewarding. You know, people just we we loved it, and the folks loved it. It was so great to be sitting with folks and have them you know, ask ask yeah. you questions about the book. Uh, and maybe that's part of what was nice. Everybody had read the book. They could ask questions about very specific events. Yeah. And we got into the topics I would never have even thought would come out of our story. And it was really 
great for us to get a broadening experience of what people were thinking about the book and how, what their reactions were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we will offer that to any of your listeners. And uh, we, you know, we're in Charlotte, but we can travel and we can also Zoom. So if folks are interested in that, we would love to participate. Yeah. And you mentioned before we started recording that there is an audiobook version of the, the book. When does that come out? Yes, that is coming out on February 13th. And I am super excited. Specifically, I um, I used to read books all the time. And then I had my my son and I don't have the luxury of holding a book in my hands anymore. So I pretty much only listen to books now. So I am super, super excited for the audio book to come out. And um, it just by by pure coincidence or chance, the narrator just happens to live in Mooresville, which is about an hour from Charlotte. And so about two weeks ago, we contacted Brandon and said, hey, let's get together. Why not? You read our book. We'd love to meet you. And so we had a lunch with him uh, during which we realized he had (laughs) pronounced our name uh, very pretty significantly it wasn't a little you oh, know yeah. mispronunciation he was, so he was mortified he, he, he was, was, really he was mortified. very uh, he was um but i think thanks you know thankfully that lunch was productive too and that we realized that so we believe tantor audio had the time to go back and correct it but was, um we had a great time we, had, we just had so much fun with brandon yeah. so we'll be we'll probably be collaborating with him on something again in the future but we're super excited for that to come out he did a really good job yeah, well once we got the pronunciation issues <laughs> straightened out so right right well thank you so much i had so much fun talking to both of you i really appreciate it oh thank you sarah we had a great time too we've been looking forward to this one it- Thank you once again to Marty and Grace for joining me for this conversation. I had so much fun. How, how wonderful were they? I just, I love listening to them. They have such great senses of humor and you can tell that they're family and that they enjoy one another. I was trying to imagine, um, writing a book with my dad and I love my dad. You know how much I love my dad. I've talked about him before. I'm not sure we would have gotten, how we would have done writing a book together. I mean, if it was anything like him trying to teach me to parallel park, not good. And we don't necessarily have any crazy adventures of this magnitude. Uh, We definitely have taken some fun trips together. He used to take my brother and I camping when we were little. That was, um, that was hiking camping, not, not car camping. We did not have 21, um, checked bags to go anywhere. No, we, we carried it. Okay. I carried a little backpack. I mean, my dad was very kind to me. He carried my sleeping bag and everything heavy, but, um, yeah, this was hike in, hike out. And, uh, some of my favorite memories with my dad, but I can't quite imagine writing a book with him. So Marty and Grace, nicely done. Good job working on the book. If you are a fan of memoirs, if you have ever, I don't know, had a bear encounter, if you like hiking and or not, if you like camping or hiking, they they do hiking in this book as well, but um, you should definitely check out this book or it would make a great gift for somebody that you know who likes any of those things. Um, The audio book is coming out, so maybe that's something that you would like to check out as well. But uh, thank you, Grace and Marty, for joining me. And of course, thank you to you, my listeners, for joining me. As always, I so very, very much appreciate you. If you have not done so already and you would like to help the podcast out, a great way to do that is to like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to this this episode on. That way you'll always be notified when there is a new episode and it also helps to get the podcast out to more listeners. You can also leave a review on that same platform, which is extremely helpful and for which I am always very, very grateful. Uh, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be one sentence. It can be... If if stars are available, you can do that, but I greatly appreciate any help you give me with the reviews. You can also follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. I should start saying X. I say that every week when I say Twitter, and I remember that it's now X, Facebook, X, Instagram, and TikTok. I hope you're having a great week. Um, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday if you're listening to it on Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of the day, whatever day of the week it is. And I hope that no matter what you're doing this week, your week affords you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Oh, 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 oh